Hello, and welcome to the next instalment of Law & Order, the video series where I look at and unpack stories from games. In this one we'll be looking at the story behind Frictional Games' fifth Amnesia instalment in the series, Amnesia The Bunker. The previous instalment was Amnesia Rebirth, but the entry did divide opinion amongst players, with the game being praised for its atmosphere, world building and story, but was lacking in other areas, such as the gameplay and resource management being extremely tedious, and the pacing of the overall story was ruined by the tension-breaking puzzles. Not to mention that people didn't like Anastasi Trianon as the game's protagonist. I've covered every Amnesia game's stories in videos on The Dark Descent, Justine, A Machine for Pigs and Rebirth, so go and check them out if you haven't already. But now on to the bunker. It was fantastic, and Frictional clearly decided to revisit the roots of Amnesia, and what made it so terrifying in the first place was also taking the franchise in a brand new direction. And they also brought back the semi-silent protagonist. Please note that there will be potential spoilers in this video for the entire Amnesia series, but I think that's everything. But before we do dive into the video, a quick word from the sponsor of this video, Atlas VPN. Atlas VPN have just started their summer campaign. And with that comes another great deal. Three years of Atlas VPN for only $1.83 per month, plus three months extra. With over 750 servers around the world, connection to Atlas VPN servers is incredibly stable and lightning fast, which means if you're a gamer playing online competitively or just for fun and need a reliable connection, then this is ideal for you. As well as that benefit, you'll also be safe from things like being DDoSed or even things like avoiding a lobby full of bots. Of course, it's not just used for gaming. As a sports fan myself living in the UK, I find it extremely difficult to watch any US sports. So I just hop onto Atlas VPN, fire up whatever US based streaming service I use and can watch anything, basketball, baseball and American football. This is also really good for using in conjunction with Netflix where you can turn on your VPN and use it to access Netflix servers around the world. Different servers of course mean different options. You can use it on multiple devices and Atlas VPN can also block any malicious links, ads and trackers and it also notifies you if and when someone is trying to steal your data. So make sure you take up this awesome three year deal because right now you can get Atlas VPN for just $1.83 per month, plus three months extra with a 30 day money back guarantee. So be quick and get your deal by clicking the link in the description or looking for the pinned link in the comments section below. The setting is the Western Front in France. It's World War I during the Battle of Verdun. Henri Clamont of the 4th Army of the 3rd Republic of France is running through the rain-soaked trenches. With gunfire and explosions all around him, Henri is eventually pinned down by soldiers of the German army. He was rescued by his friend, Augustine Lambert. A little further forward, Henri is ambushed once again and is suffering the effects of multiple gas grenades. Just about to succumb, Lambert shows up again and hands him a gas mask. Sometime later, Lambert went out on patrol and didn't return, leading to Henri setting out alone at night in an attempt to find his friend. He is walking through no man's land and spots a flare in the distance. He sees Lambert trapped in a crater, wounded. Henri went to him and he was in bad shape, dehydrated and close to death. Henri fills his canteen from a nearby water source and Lambert has a drink. Henri was able to get Lambert out of the crater using a rope, but whilst Henri was carrying Lambert, the pair were spotted by German soldiers and fired upon. An explosion goes off and Henri is knocked out and Lambert seems to have been killed. Henri then wakes up many days later in the infirmary of his unit's bunker with absolutely no memory of how he got there. What's more is that there's no one around at all. Not a soul. A nearby doctor's report by Dr. Zrzynski reveals that Henri, a private, suffered amnesia as a result of head trauma and he had trouble recalling even his own name. The plan was to transfer him to a hospital in Saint Etienne if he didn't improve. With no sign of the doctor, Henri leaves the infirmary hoping to find someone. He finds a flashlight with a pull cord, which isn't ideal, but it'll do. Then Henri finds a harrowing sight, a photo along with an autopsy of a Sergeant Reynard. Someone has absolutely torn him to shreds. Moving further into the bunker, which is mostly in darkness and bearing deep scratch marks on the walls, Henri hears someone calling for help along with a trail of blood leading to the pantry. The soldier needing help is sat up, but is gravely injured. Oh, <laughs> thought I was the last one. We're trapped down here. The red fucking officers ran and blew the exit behind them. You want to escape. You need to blow it back open. 
das Dynamite in the Arsenal. Ah, and a handle to trigger it somewhere in the excavation site. Get them, and you can make it out. Oh, shit. That thing, it's coming for me. Here, take this. Finish me off, please. I want to die at the hands of a broader soldier, not that monster. Henri goes to get the bullets from the pantry, but as he returns... So, dynamite and the detonation handle. Simple. Well, no, not really simple at all. The thing that took that soldier will be lurking around, and to make it worse, there's also a lockdown in effect. The good news is that the generator works. Henri needs to take a trip to the officer's quarters in order to find a soldier named Delisle, but it's not long until Henri comes face to face with a beast, a massive humanoid creature. Finding the deceased Delisle, and therefore the wheel needed in order to lift the lockdown, Henri has opened up areas of the bunker. The maintenance sector, where he needs to find the foreman, Foreman Stafford, who has a dog tag on him which has the code for his locker on it. Henri makes it to the pillbox and is being fired upon by German soldiers, so he can't exactly leave the bunker that way. Inside Stafford's locker was a wrench, very useful for Henri's next endeavour. He ventures into the prison area of the bunker. He needed the wrench to loosen bolts on a vent cover in order to get into a room which contained the controls for the prison cells. Inside one of the cells is Prisoner 73014, a German prisoner who was one of 20 soldiers from the 4th Reserve Corps. They were all shipped off to camps apart from this prisoner. He was thought to be a captain as he ripped his rank and insignia from his uniform just before capture. Anyway, inside his cell are some chain cutters which, again, will come in handy. Of course, the creature shows up and wants a snack. Choosing to save the prisoner or let the beast kill him, Henri goes to the soldiers' quarters next. He needs to go to the communications room. He found a note stating that some of the officers have fled the bunker, trapping the other men inside the bunker with the beast, and would promise to keep in touch via radio with the code to the arsenal. Henri needs this so he can access the dynamite needed to escape. There's still no sign of Lambert though. Henri finds a photo of Lambert, his wife and child on his bed, along with his journals in the barracks stating that he was the one who rescued Henri and carried him back to the bunker and more strangely he felt great afterwards stronger. A man so close to death being able to carry someone on his back. Something strange is going on. Either way, Lambert didn't die in the explosion. After avoiding the monster, Henri finds a key to the communication room and uses the radio to hear a code being communicated for the arsenal. One final place to go. The arsenal. Heading there, the entrance to the arsenal is on the other side of the section, so Henri has to creep round really quietly and try to get to the room containing the dynamite. He does manage it, barely, but gets the explosives needed. He heads back to the exit and places the dynamite there in its place. But Henri still needs the detonator which is in the tunnels. Throughout his time navigating the bunker, Henri has found journals which talk about an excavation. They try to open old Roman tunnels in order to use them to gain a tactical advantage against the German army. But something went wrong and was unleashed in the tunnels, and a group of soldiers decided to sabotage the mission by blowing up the tunnel in an attempt to contain whatever it was, sealing it off, accidentally trapping a soldier named Toussaint inside, but more on that shortly. Anyway, part of the bunker leading to the excavation site is flooded, but after draining it with the pump, Henri makes it through. He finds a note from one of his fellow men, the aforementioned Toussaint. Seems he was influenced by something in the tunnels, something he saw. He became obsessed with the dreams he was having as a result and hated being awake in the real world. So he gouged out his eyes so he could see properly. Walking down the tunnels, Henri sees artifacts and structures which contain a strange sort of energy and certainly don't seem to be earthly by any stretch. He hears the voice of Toussaint, who is armed with a shotgun and is very hostile. Henri takes him down, retrieves the detonator handle and returns to the dynamite. He blows it, but it doesn't clear the rubble. It instead blows a hole in the ground, but with no other option, Henri jumps down and follows it. He enters into a massive underground cavern area with more strange architecture, along with a pulsing light. Henri is able to see the exit, but he has one more face-off with the beast. After some cat and mouse, he manages to get free of it and exits the cavern. Freedom. But as he falls down the hill, he lands in some water and comes across the dead bodies of more of his fellow men. Henri hears the shouts of the German army not far from him, and the game cuts to black and ends. So, as usual with these games, due to the protagonists suffering amnesia and having no memory of what happened prior to everything going to pot, we rely upon the game's documents in order to find out what happened. It can be difficult to focus on finding the game's documents when you're being actively hunted, 
and trying to use your flashlight, which acts as a very helpful but albeit dangerous dinner bell. But we have a fair bit to discuss here, so let's begin. As we see from the start of the game, Henri was saved by a fellow soldier after he was pinned down in a trench by the forces of the German Empire and was suffering the effects of a gas grenade. This fellow soldier, named Augustine Lambert, provided Henri with a gas mask allowing him to make it out safely. Turns out that the two are the best of friends. On the 8th of July 1916, the sergeant named Joubert needed a scout to go out to the communication wires and back to the bunker again. The sergeant believed that either Henri and Lambert may have been involved in the tunnel sabotage. Henri and Lambert had a game of chance to decide who should go, but Henri used sleight of hand to trick his friend, meaning that Lambert was sent out on patrol instead. The following morning, Lambert hadn't returned from his patrol. It's made worse by the fact that the German army have just started shelling again. Henri harbours guilt for tricking his friend, which could ultimately have led to his death. He sees his fellow men laughing, drinking and singing, to the point where Henri decided that he would venture out at night and go and find Lambert. So he did. And then the game's opening section takes place, leading to Henri being knocked out and taken back to the infirmary. Let's rewind a couple of weeks. On the 30th of April 1916, an engineering team gave the go-ahead to open up some old Roman tunnels. The hope was that the French army could use the tunnels in order to spring a surprise attack on the opposition forces. On the 2nd of May, they managed to break through their old storage area and into the old Roman tunnels. The team found them to be structurally sound and very deep, and they are delighted that the tunnels will lead directly to the German line. In it, they found some urns and some strange Latin texts. Three days later, on 5th of May, a private, Nikolai Johannes writes to his love, Amanda, and states that it's been weeks since he's seen combat, but he mentions a new kind of fear spreading throughout the bunker. It seems that something is emanating from deep within it. After being woken up by the noise and going to investigate, he stood at the entrance of the Roman tunnels and something came running towards him. It was actually Toussaint, who had also been woken up by the noises. There was something down there, but Toussaint would not say what it was. After some time on the 9th of May, the officers presented Neuer with the strange aging texts. Problem is that they were too fragile to survive in a war-torn environment, so they needed more careful hands. After studying the text for a couple of days, Neuer realized that the texts were not of Roman origin. They were Latin, sure, but contained absolutely no references to Roman culture at all. They instead were of a religious or superstitious nature. A few days later, Neuer confirmed that the texts were indeed of a religious nature that the people who wrote them believed that they had found a means to immortality and to live forever. The texts also spoke of a dark world full of spirits and monsters, endlessly alive with the cries of torment. Neuer calls the tunnels a doorway into some pagan hell, and finishes by mentioning that the texts speak of some sort of substance that is meant to grant the worthy some sort of immortality. It gets creepier. Neuer actually told no one about what was described in the texts, However, a private LaRue came out of the tunnels talking about the things he'd seen, which were accurately described in the texts. Not just that, but he'd written a letter to officers Fournier and Blanchet. He explained that he'd noticed a strange glowing liquid seeping from the walls of the Roman tunnels. He turned around and he was now standing in a vast plain of darkness. A light in the distance appeared to be calling LaRue forwards. But LaRue blinked and was back in the tunnel again. He was haunted by what he saw and requests medical leave. Neuer files a report stating what he had found from the texts. Remember Toussaint, how he came out of the tunnels and saw Johannes? Well, Toussaint mentions that he dreams of taking part in a ritual, drinking a sweet liquid which fills him with carnal desires. He talks of her an ending kingdom. He speaks of, again of immortality. Toussaint finished by mentioning that he only wants to exist in the dreams and visions he experiences, explaining why Toussaint gouged his own eyes out so that he could see properly. LaRue, on the other hand, had been telling his fellow men in the bunker what he saw in the tunnels, and three days later, on the 18th of May, he was punished by high command. Neuer was worried that they'd come for him next. Neuer speaks of some kind of terrible force that lurks in the shadows all around them. A high command did in fact get to Neuer and put him under surveillance, and he was locked in a cell in the bunker's prison by an officer named Renard. They'd assumed that all these superstition had originated from Neuer in the first place, and that all these rumours were making the soldiers jittery. Renard ordered the engineering team to just carry on digging. Neuer was eventually released, but went back to his bunk in the soldiers' quarters and discovered the other men who each had their own stories to tell. They'd all encountered unseen things down in the tunnels. They decided to keep it to themselves out of a fear of being punished by the officers again. The following evening, Neuer is sent out as part of scheduled raids. He returns from the raids a couple of days later and reveals that they'd lost a lot of men, but just two nights later on the evening of the 25th, 
it would all begin to kick off. The sounds, the howling, the growling would get louder and louder. Noya would dream of other worlds. He awoke the following morning and vowed to enter the tunnels in order to find a way to end whatever is happening. A private Ozan then writes to a private Faber. He mentions that they pulled Noya from the tunnels and he had been screaming for hours before they got to him, screaming so much that all that was coming out of him was a rasping sound. A plan is formulated. Three days later, the men who all swore things down in the tunnels decide on the plan of action. Spurred at their annoyance at how Noya and LaRue were treated by the officers, Reynard and Fournier, a group of saboteurs decided to steal dynamite from the arsenal and use it to blow up and seal the tunnels containing whatever was inside them. Remember Toussaint wanted to live in the dream world? Well, Toussaint had wandered into the tunnels and the saboteurs had trapped Toussaint in there and that is where he removed his eyes. He speaks of being able to see, that his eyes are right for what he needs to see. Meanwhile, Fournier and Reynard started on their investigation of the sabotage and they start with Noya and LaRue. Fournier believes they've likely been planning this sabotage for weeks. After around three days of investigation, Reynard has managed to obtain confessions that implicate LaRue, Johannes, Toussaint, Renoir and Erzan. Four of them are in the cells, but obviously Toussaint is missing. They speculate that he may be dead from the blast. The soldiers did try and explain why they sealed the tunnels in order to save their fellow men, but Reynard is more annoyed that they've lost what High Command thought was a tactical advantage on the Germans. Not only that, but large parts of the arsenal and bunker are now flooded as a result. The saboteurs are all court-martialed. But the plan to blow up the tunnels kind of worked. It worked in the sense that the nightmares had now stopped. The saboteurs that had been caught were being tortured by Reynard and another officer named Delphi. The person writing this journal entry states that they're certain their brothers will be court-martialed and that haunts them. So we know that Lambert carried Henri back to the bunker. According to Joubert's journal, Lambert, despite being, you know, almost dead, managed to rise up like Lazarus and literally carried Henri on his back. Joubert even states that it's very strange that Lambert wasn't injured from the fall or the explosion, but he was injured. How does a man so close to death manage to carry his friend back to the bunker on his back? It's because of this. Lambert describes it in his journal as being crisp, like refreshing water, but with a sweet taste to it. Even Lombert in his journal states that he doesn't know how on earth he was able to carry Henri back to the bunker. The following day, Lombert writes about a toy rabbit that he bought for his son. He mentions that it must have fell from his backpack when he fell into the crater. Then Lombert writes that he feels great, stronger and stronger, that he feels he's got a new purpose in life. His rhetoric becomes different and then he speaks about the men hearing something scratching at the walls. This is echoed in Faber's journal, but he elaborates that it can't be rats as the scratching is not erratic enough. Someone went to investigate but found nothing. The men, of course, didn't want to say anything as they know what happened last time. They were locked up and tortured. Lambert, meanwhile, has more pressing issues. He begins sensing a change in his hands. They're getting bigger and they feel like they're not a part of him anymore. Then Lambert slips fully into total madness and eventually Lambert transforms into this, the beast all because he drank the water from the crater. This is doubly confirmed as when using the toy rabbit on the bridge, the beast stops and looks at it, giving Henri a chance to get rid of the beast for good. Anyway, two days later on the 15th, Reynard is killed. As previously mentioned, he'd been torn to shreds. Lambert was the one who killed Reynard. Lambert didn't recall killing Reynard though due to memory loss as a result of his transformation. As for the officers, they've been getting jittery after hearing someone moving through the quarters despite there being no patrols scheduled. Joubert had previously thought it was Reynard, wandering the halls drunk. But it wasn't him, as he ended up eviscerated by the beast. Many soldiers were suspected of the murder, even the German prisoner who was locked in a cell at the time. It's particularly harrowing when Joubert signs off by saying that he'd rather face a thousand German guns than whatever it is that seems to be stalking them. Anyway, Fournier is determined to find out who killed Reynard, so he begins yet another investigation. But the men are convinced that no human could have done such a thing. The other men were panicked as they thought they'd resolve the situation by sabotaging the tunnel, but the day after, Faber has had enough. He grabs his revolver and sets out to find the beast and to kill it, but it didn't go well at all. Faber died. After shooting the beast just made it angrier, it retreated and then returned for him 10 minutes later. So, two days later, Fournier ordered that the remaining men form up in squads and hunt the beast and kill it. They report that bullets can't harm it at all, so Fournier does what any good leader would do and he just sends them off to kill it again. 
One of the officers, Sergeant Joubert, writes in his final journal entry on the 20th of July and states that Fournier has basically fallen apart, lost to fear, repeating over and over again that they should just flee. That Fournier wants to run and blow up the exit behind him, sealing the beast and their men inside the bunker. So what do the officers do? They flee, blowing up the exit with a promise that they will radio the arsenal door code to the men left inside so that they too can blast their way out. Excellent, great leadership there. The next day, the man who considered himself to be the last remaining man alive in the bunker, a private Boisron, writes to whoever may have survived and tells them how to get out should he fail. And this, of course, was the man Henri met by the pantry after he'd woken up from his coma. There were, of course, even more creatures in the tunnels. Kind of. We'll get to that shortly. But remember, the men heard howling and screeching coming from the tunnels way before Lombard drunk the water. Two months before. The men had also been noticing that the rats in the bunker seemed to be acting strangely, that they were looking disfigured almost. They also discovered that the problem was getting worse. The rats were swarming and eating deceased bodies. The smell of the wounded also seemed to be attracting them. The usual doctrine of giving soldiers Christian burials was scrapped, and the bodies were instead burned, as it was discovered that the rats had absolutely no interest in burnt bodies. Alright, so finally let's have a look at the connections this game has to the other Amnesia games in the series. Let's begin with Amnesia The Dark Descent. The antagonist of The Dark Descent was described as the Immortal Baron, and his name was Alexander of Brennenberg. He was actually from a place called the Other World, also known as the Dark World, except he was known there as Aandra the Apostate. That was until he was banished. A lot of the Dark Descent story centres around orbs, which were Mithraic artefacts. Alexander's goal was essentially to get home to the Other World again to reunite with his love. He needed a special substance to power the orbs, and that was something called Vitae. Human essence, essentially, and the only way to get it was, well, it was torture, through human pain and suffering. The orb that Alexander used to try and get home was destroyed, however, another one was found in the tomb of Tin Hinan in Algeria. The protagonist of the Dark Descent, Daniel, found the orb after being trapped within a passage on an expedition in Algeria, but Daniel dropped and broke the orb and took the pieces back to London. Daniel was chased by a fleshy entity, a protector of the orb known as the Shadow, which pursued him throughout the entire game. It was then that he was contacted by Alexander, who invited Daniel to Brennenberg Castle, who could save Daniel from the Shadow, but Alexander tricked Daniel into torturing people for him. It's complicated, but if you're interested in the story of the Dark Descent, then go and watch my video on it. Anyway, that gives some brief background. As for connections to a machine for pigs, Mandus did mention at one point that he saw the future of his children and saw them both dying at some point during the Battle of the Somme, which is of course when the bunker takes place in the timeline, but that's only a minor link, as in Machine for Pigs, Mandus killed his children because he didn't want them to die in battle. I can't really see any connection between the bunker and Justine, but there were lots of connections to Amnesia Rebirth. At the start of Rebirth, we can see that the plane flying over the Algerian desert momentarily enters into the other world. One of the translations of the text that Neuer received talked about a doorway in order to obtain immortality. Remember I mentioned they called Alexander the Immortal Baron? Alexander arrived on Earth in the late 16th century and was still there alive and kicking around 300 years later. This moves me on to the next point, Empress Tihana. Bear in mind that the bunker is essentially a prequel to Rebirth, which itself took place in 1937. If you played Rebirth, you'll know that for years and years, Empress Tiana was obsessed with one thing, becoming a mother. Problem was that she was barren and couldn't conceive a child despite trying many times. Empress Tiana then obviously wanted to keep herself alive for as long as possible, so she learned about and sought out Vitae in order to be able to preserve her own life to bring her immortality. She would appear as a spectral form, but actually appeared like this, hooked up to many tubes, feeding her constant supplies of Vitae. This was done, as in Dark Descent, by torturing people and harvesting their essence. The bunker makes a connection to this by way of Neuer's texts, which describe the other world, which of course was full of torture for people's Vitae. But Empress Tiana still couldn't conceive. That was until she detected a fetus inside Anastasi Trianon, and she wanted it. When the group Tassi was travelling with were dying from their heat, dehydrated and desperate for water, the Empress appeared to them in her spectral form and took them to a place called the Tower to drink from a water source. But in exchange, Tassi would stay in the other world until the child was born and Tassi would give her the child. Additionally, this tower could have been the light that one of the soldiers saw beckoning him from the other world. But anyway, Tassi refused to give up the child, naturally, but the Empress let them drink to restore themselves anyway. 
However, this water source gradually turned the entire crew into ghouls, creatures that would enact the will of Empress Tiana by extracting the vitae needed in order to sustain her. Now, the water is pretty much the exact same water as Lombert drank from Henri's canteen while he was trapped in the crater, leading to Lombert turning into what was essentially a ghoul, just a really big ghoul. These ghouls from Rebirth were seen in a ghostly form at some point in the bunker too. What's interesting is that the men reported hearing rhythmic scratching sounds coming from the walls. This likely wasn't anything physical at all. It was likely the same sound Tassie heard when losing her sanity in Amnesia Rebirth, a constant scratching sound in her head. And a note also mentions that someone was seeing something in the corner of his eyes. This is also similar to what Tassie experienced in Rebirth. Toussaint as well speaks of seeing her kingdom. This is likely Empress Tihana's kingdom that he's seeing, the other world. And then there's the religion mentioned in the texts. The religion in question is the mysterious ancient Roman religion of Mithraism. It centers around a deity called Mithra, who is the god of the sun. We do see statues of humans holding orbs in one of the underground tunnel areas underneath the bunker. And these orbs were Mithraic artifacts themselves, and their power was connected to something called the Traveler's Locket, which you'll recall Tassi used in order to travel through rifts, or tears, through to the other world. These rifts, these openings, would be signified by vibrating stones in a strange blue light, and these also appear underneath the bunker in identical fashion to the ones in Rebirth, meaning that there is likely a tear between the two worlds, which as well as how the water source that Lambert drank from ended up inside the crater. These tears are also likely how the men started seeing visions of the other world, just as Tassi Trianon did when their plane was flying over the desert. The architecture in the large cavern was also strikingly similar to the architecture from Rebirth, but they are all the things I can think of that link the series together. If you can think of any more, then please comment them down below, but if you enjoyed this video, then please leave a like and subscribe to the channel to support. But for now, take care, and I will see you in the next one.